Hello, I'm Professor Jagdish N. Sheth at Emory University in Atlanta. This presentation is on the real reasons why Donald Trump won the 2016 presidential race in America. While the general popular belief is that it was populism as a movement worldwide, anti-incumbency, which I agree, but anti-incumbency is not an overnight phenomenon. It takes quite a while. It brews just like a volcano before it erupts. So we need to analyze what are the root causes of anti-incumbency or populism. And my analysis leads to the same three reasons as any place else. Namely, it was economics, economics, economics. As you know, in retailing, we always say it is location, location, location. In politics, surprisingly, it is economics, economics, economics. Even though we may attribute to international affairs, we may attribute to ideology, or the struggle between faith and their branches, but ultimately what matters to the voters is whether their stomachs are full, which is an employment, and their wallets are full, which is savings, and their wealth creation. So here are the three main reasons why Donald Trump won the 2016 presidential election in America. The first one is the permanent decline of unionized labor, and it reached a 97-year low in 2013 when only 6.5% of the labor actually was unionized, especially in the private sector, not counting the government sector. The power of the unions which backed the Democratic Party just vanished. Union members who were loyal to the unions could not deliver what rest of the world will call as a vote bank. And obviously, it seems like everybody took it for granted that the labor class will always work for or vote for Democrats. And that was proven clearly wrong in this election. As if that was not enough, where your job security is no longer there, and really began after the first energy crisis in 74-78, and the restructuring of the economy in the 80s when we did actually more automation than ever before. We did more outsourcing than ever before and it continued all through in fact the Clinton administration. It is very important to realize that in addition to that the second major factor was impacting not just jobs but also the balance sheet or the wealth creation. The working class, unionized labor, mostly majority white, mostly in the Midwest or the manufacturing centers of America, had saved hard through hard work and belief in the middle class belief system to save for the future, primarily in the home equity, which was rising all the time, especially in the 90s, with valuation of the home skyrocketing before the bubble burst in many ways. And also, in fact, in 401k plans, where again the stock market was rising above the average over so many years. Both of them burst suddenly in 2007 and 8, and people lost all of their lifelong savings and wealth, which actually they resented. For the first time, both in terms of daily income or monthly income, hourly wages, as well as any savings, there was a true economic regression. So the Great Recession of 2007 and 8 was a second major blow in terms of the average person's economic survival, let alone economic well-being and economic future positioning. The third area had to do with very strong inequality between the CEO compensation and a working class person's compensation. So if you take the average worker and the salary, the difference between the CEO compensation is about 20 times, let's say till 1964-65, it began to suddenly increase, not because the workers' wages were increasing, but the CEO and the senior executive's compensation began to skyrocket 
surprisingly in fact again in the 90s and it reached a peak of 300 times in 2013. You resent to that. Nobody deserves within a company that kind of an income or economic disparity. And you're losing everything that you invested all your life. So these three factors combined together created an enormous revolt toward the status quo. Now, in addition to that, there were three enabling factors, mostly episodal, mostly situational. Unfortunately, the world economy began to slow down when China's economy that was growing at a breakneck speed suddenly began to falter. From 10, 11% growth for 30 years, became the second largest economy. The growth began to nosedive to six and a half, six percent primarily because European Union was not growing. That was in a mess. Japan was not growing. Korea was barely growing, which are key economies for Chinese export markets, as was the American market, of course. And Chinese economy began to shift from export-oriented economy to more and more domestic services-oriented economy, creating a huge impact negatively on the worldwide growth. It also happened with Brazil. It happened with Russia. The only lone star that was still bright was India. The BRICS nations, as we call them, which were supposed to provide a huge economic growth among emerging markets, did not happen. Second major factor was the unrest and the uneasiness in the Middle East. U.S. investment in the Middle East had already crossed more than a trillion dollars in the war in Afghanistan, Iraq, but now you see the unrest everywhere. All of the above Sahara countries, from Algeria, in fact, to Egypt, to Turkey, are in turmoil. And that again engages the U.S. in a way as a world leader from a geopolitical view that was again putting a lot of strain on both the fiscal policy as well as the monetary policy. And monetary policy didn't help as much. While the interest rates were dropped down to zero level from two and a half, three percent, and the quantitative easing, which is pouring money, became so large that the Federal Reserve balance sheet ballooned from 900 billion to 4.5 trillion to save from Great Recession of 2007-8, it didn't work. The spark didn't happen to the extent that it should have happened. And a third factor, which really press hasn't talked about, is actually data mining and predictive analytics that the Republican National Committee had organized way back some time ago Surprisingly, with the help of an Indian on an H-1 or H-4 visa, and they had learned how to target at the district level around which House of Commons or Congress is organized. Not the Senate side, but on the Congress side. And this is where the data mining allowed very strong micro-targeting by the Republican Party and Donald Trump was very willing to go out and create huge motivational, inspirational speeches, more inflammatory than probably necessary, and was, was able to bring the crowds unimagined on the Republican side. So you had this anti-incumbency underlying fervor and now bring them to the polls as did Bernie Sanders, for example, on the Democratic side, but it might have actually fragmented the Democratic voting power, whereas in Republicans it got united. Post-election, if you see the map of where the red states are, you can clearly see it's all in the Midwest, the manufacturing belt, some in the agricultural sector by and large, and all of them were struggling to survive economically. So my view is that what matters in politics is economics, not ideology, 
not faith as we always think about, or international aspects. And in fact, if you analyze the elections since, again, the first energy crisis on a worldwide basis, it was the economics that made the difference. George H.W. Bush, Sr. Bush, very popular president because we took a stand against Iraq and pushed them out from Kuwait when Iraq had taken over and possessed Kuwait, 1990-1991. Probably more popular president than Ronald Reagan at that time, both domestically and internationally. America became the most admired nation. And in the 2000, I mean, 1992 election, he's gone after one term. Here comes Bill Clinton, who was an unknown the governor from Arkansas, nobody expected him even to rise in the politics to be nominated by the Democratic Party and eventually win the elections. Because it, what matters is the economy is stupid, as they call it. And this is true in England. This was true in Germany. This was true in Japan. In fact, Japan has a history of having prime ministers elected every one or two years, similar to Italy, for example. Again, unpredictability, but all of them have an underlying root cause, which is economic well-being of the popula population. So long as we have economic well-being of the population, in terms of jobs, as well as in terms of savings and wealth, whether it is done by fiscal policy, done by monetary policy, or just done by autocratic dictator governmentships, doesn't make any difference, people are happy. And they would like to have the incumbent party or the incumbent person continue the journey. So the real reasons for Donald Trump's unexpected victory is very expected. It is very predictable. It's a long-term phenomenon, not a short-term. And somebody can actually arouse into a movement, as Donald Trump did and Bernie Sanders did, so we need to watch for future elections, what is the economic well-being of a country or economy and how that is likely to brew one more time into another election unpredictability. Thank you very much.